Well, hi, everybody. This is the first seminar at the fifth A to D Exeter uh, show, and we're very pleased to have a very exciting collection of people on this panel today. I should introduce myself. I'm Martin Walker. I write for Sound on Sound, and I'm also a sound designer. And uh, on my right here, I've got Gary Bonham. Bonham. I can be Gary Bonham. You can be Gary Bonham. Mm -hmm. who started his uh, production career in Iceland working with Bjork, which is a very interesting start. And he's also worked with George Michael, Danny Minogue, and Cheryl Crow, among others. He's also a frequent guest lecturer at several universities in the UK, speaking on songwriting, production, and mixing, and works closely with uh, Propeller... I can't even say that. <laughs> Propeller Heads Software Reason. And here next to me on the other side is Tony Butler. He's a rock bassist best known for his lengthy work with the uh, Scottish rock band Big Country. And he's also worked with the Pretenders, Roger Daltrey, and Pete Townsend, amongst others. He's recently started working as a music teacher at Devon's Petrock College up in Barnstable, close by, and the Livewire Youth Music Product, uh, Project in Cornwall. Next to him, in the middle on that side, is Hassam Ramsey, who is an uh, Egyptian percussionist and composer who's worked with Peter Gabriel, Joan Armour Trading, Jimmy Page, and Robert Plant, among others. He's also built his own state-of-the-art recording environment, the Drumsy Studio, in which he has the latest in recording technology for mixing the best of old and new world sounds. And finally, last but definitely not least, is Paul Gray. He's played bass for everyone from Johnny Thunders, of the New York Dolls, to Rat Scabies, The Damned, and Andrew Ridgely of Wham!, He's also a regional officer for the British Musicians' Union in Wales and the southwest of England, and still tours and records with Captain Sensible and guests with the damned. So let's give our uh, speakers a nice warm welcome. Cool rhythm section, eh? Yeah, <laughs> very good rhythm section. One thing, yeah, I would, one, thing I would, <laughs> one thing I would like to add. I too worked with Big Country. Right, so there's them. another link for it. We're all the best of friends. And the other link I have to share is, unfortunately, I wrote and produced the ill-fated Andrew Ridgely solo, solo album, which Paul right. played would, on. So. Would you like to leave now? Or? I can go now. We can go to a vote if you prefer. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Right, the subject of this seminar is the digital future of music. What we thought we'd talk about is how you can combine the best of ancient and modern technology. And also now, so many of us are working by ourselves. There are so many bedroom studios and state-of-the-art studios, but people are so many of them working by themselves. It's interesting to see which is more creative, working by yourself or with a comp uh, producer or with other composers or other musicians. Different ways of working now. We've got all these new options in the digital age. And the biggest thing that's changed in the digital age is that we can now collaborate in real time, over the internet, or you can have the, the pass the parcel type uh, productions where people work on a track and then they send it off down the internet again, somebody else puts a bit on. So there are all sorts of different ways of working and these guys have had all sorts of different production methods over the years. So it'll be interesting to find out how they get the best out of other musicians and how they get the best out of their own music. But I'd like to start out actually talking to Gary because he worked with Bjork in the early days, admittedly, but Bjork is renowned for unusual combinations of instruments, string quartets and sort of almost heavy metal sounds, and she gets uh, musicians to design new instruments for her stage shows. She's used the reactable um, uh, digital technology on stage where you put items on a, on a lit... Uh, podium to create sounds, all sorts of weird and wonderful things that all seem to work, but very different ways of working. When you worked with her, were those signs already there that she was a different no, way? No, no, not, not really, because uh, I should qualify this by saying this is even pre-Sugar um, Cubes. This was, she had a band called Kukla, who, uh, there were just three of them, and the one thing that really struck me about her was how shy she is. Very, very shy, and um, but almost like this explosion when she sings, and then she kind of goes back into this very, I mean, I'm sure she's not like this now. This, this was a long time ago that I worked with her, over 20 years, so um, I'm, I never cease to be amazed at how progressive she is as an artist, though, and I think um, one of the things which always excites me about 
different artists is, is the, those that continue to reinvent themselves, and I think she certainly fits into that category. Um, a lot of the a lot of the <coughs> musicians and artists that I like are, are people that continually do that. That, if you like, rip up the rule book and say, "Well, I'm going to do this complete. I've done it that way. Now I'm going to move on and do it a different way." So, mm. is it that she guides it, or do other people come along that she meets and think she thinks I can go in another? direction? What, what moves artists in a particular way? I mean, the classic example, I suppose, is Brian Eno, who seems to mm. guide people in very strange directions mm. when he goes into his production yeah. duties, taking people into a different mindset almost. Yeah. I, think, I think it's all about taking an artist out of their comfort zone. Uh, the worst thing for me is, is if you continually do what's uh, comfortable, and you often have to, uh, I, I think the Eno philosophy, I don't know if any of you know about oblique strategies, um, which is he, this, this set of cards which he, well, actually it was when he was ill in the 70s, he sat in his, or lay in his bed, and he came up with all, all of these different strategies where, I don't know, it could be anything from um, take the most important thing in your track, or what you consider to be the most important thing, and mute it, or turn it down. And the thing which is least important, make it the loudest. <coughs> um, it could be something as general as go and make a cup of tea, or go and, I don't know, mow the lawn or something. But uh, in... in Eno's typically eccentric way. Um, I think what he's trying to do is stop people from working um, in, their, in their kind of conventional way. And actually, there's a great little story here, if you don't mind me telling this. Uh, I used to be, I used to have a room at Olympic Studios, and uh, the last album we did there was U2's last album, Low Line on the Horizon. And my room had a knock before you enter, and Brian changed it to rock before you enter, because he couldn't stand the fact that U2 were a rock band. And he was con his, his sole purpose with U2 is to stop them being a rock band and make them something else, even though, obviously, they fight that. And I think the idea of the resistance between Eno and what U2 stand for, which is four guys in a room, uh, a rock band, I think that resistance is, is, is sometimes good. Uh, if you look at a band, uh, an album maybe like Actung Baby, which is the early 90s, I think there's a lot of that resistance there with the kind of more conventional... Um, Lanoir approach to production to the more, uh, should we say, out there approach from Eno. So uh, hopefully some of that makes sense. Yeah, that made a lot of sense to me. Hassam, I'd like to bring you in here. Um, your drumsy studio has got state-of-the-art recording equipment, yeah. and yet some of the instruments you play are many centuries old. How yeah. do you think you get the best out of combining ancient and modern, really <coughs> ancient and really modern? How do you approach it? It's quite a, um, a specific approach which I've learned from Peter Gabriel himself, and that is he uses the technology to serve the naturalness of any production that he does. It is so easy these days and has been you know, since eternity to be able to press a button and then the, the sequencer or the sequencing machine will be able to just repeat the same loop and then jump to another loop and whatever. But he believes in having state of the art but with a human face. We stretch time, we add dimensions into the music and take things and I believe like the technology helps me to be able to very quickly say, well, okay, what will happen if I turn this around? What will happen, like, like Brian Eno was, was doing, kind of like saying, okay, take down the most important thing and put up the, the most unimportant sound and see what this sounds like. And, but then um, one, one, one other philosophy of Peter's is that you don't go into the studio. Sorry, I'm going to steal the line that you were going to say. <laughs> and that is, once you go into the production, you have to separate that from the creativeness of the moment that you went in. Because for any artist, and I'm sure the room is full of artists today, and that is, it takes one billionth of a second to mock up and create a new picture of how you want this to happen. But then once you go into fulfilling that picture and making it into solid reality that you can hear or you can 
visually see. That's it. Keep that picture in mind. Keep that vision and create it. Otherwise, you will never be able to find out if that <coughs> vision that you had was right or wrong. How does that tie in, though, with all these bands that go into the studio and spend six months trying to come up with ideas if they don't have a very clear vision at the start? It's wonderful if you can follow a goal, if you've got a very clear idea, but how do you get inspired if you haven't got ideas? I suppose this is when we come on to uh, getting producers involved. How do you inspire other people to get creative? Right. It's like going into the studio to try to find out how long is the piece of string or is a piece of string. I don't believe in going into a studio and then let's sock it and see. It's, that is one of the things, if I may say, which brings down the music industry because far too much money is being spent on this kind of thing. You have to be, and also I would like to be able to, this is why I've gone into teaching and this is why I trust also my brother here has gone into to teaching the people how to you know, you don't have to learn how to be creative. You are already creative. Just become a producer yourself. This thought that I had is right. And then with the right method of communication between the artists themselves, they can communicate the vision. It's like an architect in a building site. You don't go to the architect and then halfway through the house, you say, um, now, what kind of roof do you think we should have on this house? The roof should have already been designed. The kitchen should have been put in the right place. You can't say, oh, no, we're going to have the kitchen there. No, we're going to have the kitchen there. You just, when you get to the production side, you go in and build the house. But you can experiment. We're going to use this type of brick for the wall, or shall we make it this type of wall? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> you know, or that it's, it's interesting that you have this. I can see that's a very good way of working if you have ideas at the start. Tony, how, how do you approach it? If you're an educator, you're also a bassist. I'm not saying that that one precludes the other. It's all important. It's all important. You My approach from the bottom up with only with women. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I've got two very distinct philosophies which have been born out of, of doing this for 30 years. Um, my upbringing in music was um, predominantly with the, the, with the Townsend family. Um, I worked and was a very great family friend with uh, Simon Townsend and his, at that time, very unknown brother called Pete. <clears throat> and the whole idea of, being, of having music in your life was sharing it. It's a sense of community. It was a group of people who enjoyed doing the same thing and enjoyed creating. And it was just the excitement of being in a group, creating music, whether it's playing other people's music or endeavouring to create your own. That was the, the basic factor of being in a group. And, uh, and again, a philosophy you referred to you two earlier on. I know that that was very much part of their philosophy. Because when I actually arrived with uh, Big Country, we, we were that kind of force that had a kind of chemistry which was kind of brought together by whatever means and we would just think about what we should be doing musically and how we should and bring that to fruition and um, it was very much like that we were a little boys club we were just a very close-knit community and it was all just about creating we would write separately and then come together and then bring our ideas together and try to knit those together but it wasn't until Steve Lillywhite came in, because we'd already recorded our first album three quarters of the way through with Chris Thomas at Air Studios in London when it was there. <clears throat> and um, Chris Briggs, who was our A&R man at the moment, kind of thought, this isn't the band I'm seeing live. This isn't the kind of community, this fantastic sound and, and noise that I knew. Um, and then we brought Steve Lillywhite in, and he, he brought something which I never understood. I've always heard of this, this term, producer. And he came in and he just became an instant fifth member of the group. And he immersed himself in the music as much as we did. 
uh, and then engineered everything from the control room. Uh, and then we would then see this, according to Hazam, this, this template of this construct that Steve Lillywhite had, you know, becoming into fruition in front of us. Mm. And uh, we did all this down at, at the manor. And the first album experience for us in that sort of setting really turned us into a group. And that philosophy in terms of making music, writing <coughs> music, stayed with us ever since. We never actually wrote anything together. We, we bought ideas and then we mashed them together. And nine times out of 10, Stuart went away and, and wrote lyrics on top of it. But the concept of creating music in any different way um, wasn't part of the thinking. But since, since then, uh, you know, mid 90s onwards, when people like me in groups, you know, spend a bit of money on recording stuff, you upgrade your recording scenario and you get all these wonderful tools. Uh, you become then very isolated. You sit in dark rooms with your toys, with your wife knocking on the door saying, come on, be sociable. And you've got this wonderful gear and you're creating all these wonderful pieces of music on your own. But what you're not doing is you're not interacting with other people. You're not getting the blend which makes good music, great mm. music. So I'm quite ambivalent about the fact that, you know, the new technology encourages people to to make music on their own, share it across the internet or whatever. But I think it's because of the kind of community of music making that I've come from. So I don't want to appear to be sort of biased on one sided or ignorant, but I think you've got to look at the issues as to where the music is actually coming from and, and then decide what sort of avenue to take in order to create. Mm. I'd like to bring in Paul here because we've talked on several occasions now about producers, and I know as you're representing the Musicians' Union in the area, you might give us a bit of an insight into the tricky parts of using a producer, talking about payment and studio costs, how, as we've just heard, sometimes producers end up as the fifth member of the band, so they might require royalties, and how does it all work? What sort of different arrangements do people have? Um, I can't answer that in a couple of minutes, but I'll give a kind of brief I'll one. give I mean, you five. <laughs> firstly, it's interesting because I worked with Gary about 24 years ago, playing the bass on Andrew's album. And, uh, and Gary, as a producer, did about 99% of everything, from what I remember, from the kind of producing, engineering, songwriting. Um, and Steve Lillywhite also produced the uh, second Eddie and Hot Rods album. And he was still um, a house engineer at Island St. Peter Square back then. And I absolutely agree with Tony, he was a fifth member of the band. And uh, actually, contrary to what you were saying, we kind of went back then, we went in without having really any idea what we were doing. We had the kind of the bones of the song, but everything else was kind of done on the fly. I mean, we were up 24 hours in those days, so it was kind of like the clock, you know, just went round and round and round. But Steve just kept coming up with these ideas. And it was, yeah, let's try that, let's try that. And it all kind of worked, and he was such a great, Catalyst, and I think that's what a, a great producer should be is a catalyst to get the best out of the band. But anyway, I'm digressing. Um, I was going to talk about this in my thing upstairs later on this afternoon, um, but the, the, the main point is to understand um, when you're going into a studio is, is who owns what, who's entitled to do what with the recordings, and from um, my experience recently uh, with my EMU hat on, um, there's, it's quite common a situation where a band will get off a of free, uh, free studio time, for example, um, and they don't understand that the studio then will own the rights to the recording, or the producer kind of says, come and I'll give you some free studio time. It all sounds great, and it kind of is great, but um, I've got one particular band at the moment who've been to Germany with a very well-known producer, and there's absolutely nothing in writing. Um, and the intentions, I'm sure, are all fantastic. But when we actually sat down and had a chat about it, they weren't aware of the implications about actually what was going to happen with their recordings. And once they were placed, how the producer, who'd given his time for free on spec, was going to be remunerated. Because they, you know, everybody's got to try and earn from it. So it's about understanding whether um, you're going to a studio and that includes production, because some studios kind of do everything, whether they're going to bring somebody else in, whether you're engaging a producer um, individually as well as maybe an engineer in the studio. There's so many variables. 
Um, and it all needs to be understood really to save any kind of misunderstandings and contention and arguments and things happening later on down the line. So it's all about really getting it in writing first of all. Well, this is one of the reasons I've got into education because I think this stuff that you've been talking about here is, is sadly lacking. It's not common knowledge. People have to find out mostly the hard way. Mm. Whereas now, um, you know, one of my philosophies about teaching is to bring this f it from an educational platform so people who are engaging have some knowledge of what they're getting into and they're, they're starting off on a better foot. Absolutely, yeah. I totally agree with that too. Um, even two days ago, I fell into a situation, nothing to do with music, where a person understood that um, they're going to be getting this particular commission on something that was done, but it was supposed to be on one particular thing that was being done, <coughs> not the future of the band. And then I realized that my mistake was that I did not put it in writing mm. because that person was like my brother, my absolute best friend. And now I have a phone call that has been shut in my face. They're always your best friend when you start working. <laughs> if I just... well, this, is, this person has pr proved best brother, best friend, beyond, but there is a misunderstanding. And as you're, mm. I, What I like about the musician union point of view if it is not in writing, you will be in dispute. I've got a very simple agreement here that any member can download for free. Um, and it's simply an agreement um, prior to recording session. Um, and in English, it says, uh, this is to be used where there's no written agreement between the parties which covered the recordings to be made and the ownership in them. And it sets out the name of the band or the artist, the name of the producer of the studio. Uh, and it said, you've agreed to give us studio time for a session on this date or these dates in consideration of some of one pound for which you acknowledge um, in relation to recordings can be made in the studio you agree that you will not commercially exploit them that you sell them onwards or permit the commercial exploitation in whole or in part until we have entered into an agreement a signed written agreement with use the contrary which simply says fantastic we, we've, we've done recordings we acknowledge that but before something happens, then we have to have a proper agreement in place. And that saves all the kind of arguments and contention. Free yeah. to download if you're a member from, from the site now. Yeah, perfect. Dead, dead simple. It's interesting, actually, we've mentioned Steve uh, Lillywhite on several occasions now, becoming a fifth member of the band or a whatever member of the band. How does it work then, if anyone would like to chip in here, when somebody does start <coughs> uh, creating a lot of music, how do you work that? How do you work out the equation then when somebody's offering creative input? When do they stop being a producer? When do they become another member of the band, uh, the fifth beat or whatever? I've got two very quick examples. Steve Lillywhite um, had a producer fee and percentage, and that was it, full stop, end of story. That was his remit, which was brilliant. I also worked with a, another producer, I won't mention his name, but he's an Austrian a keyboard wizard recorded an album and he wanted a percentage of practically everything and it was a complete and utter nightmare and again i think it was down to warner brothers our record company in america and our management not sorting him out before we started recording because it was a brutal experience at, on completion yeah my my, my my law or my policy from today onwards is that you know you have to put it in writing yeah. and it's better to not engage, no matter how talented the other person is and how much they're going to bring into the project. Um, it's better not to have them on the project mm -hmm. and have the project come out in a different kind of way mm -hmm. than to then end up with the Mona Lisa that you hate <coughs> because <laughs> of what happened with this person, or these two people, or this group of whatever. I mean, good heart, we're not short of. Goodwill, we're not short of. Willingness to perform with others. I mean, I think this is the dream of every person in this room here, you know? We love to collaborate, we love to create, we love to be part of 
a team and all of this, but if there is no rule that we all fully understand, so therefore you understand the perimeters of the game. It's like playing football without rules, as happens in every match that we see today. If I can, if I can add, I think the cliche, where there's a hit, there's a writ, is certainly in my experience, when I enter a room, I was signed to Warner Chapel for 20 years as a, as a songwriter. So in other words, my role as a producer was also quite often as a songwriter. And whenever I walked into a room, the understanding was that it was an equal split. I don't get into any of that kind of, well, there's 5% here and because you programmed the high app button, you get, I don't know, half a percent here. And I'm always very wary of people that are like that with me. And I probably won't continue to, to work with them. Um, but I do think that it is very smart to have an agreement and just put something down on paper, as Paul said. Takes I think it's minutes. just common sense. Takes five minutes. Yeah. And, and, and I certainly, I, I had a, a record which, I, I won't name the artist actually, in America, which I had a number two record with. And really up until about six weeks before the record came out, they, they, even though I wrote the song, they tried to write me out by, there were various producers would get involved and somebody did the middle eight, and then somebody wrote a little bit, and you guys, I'm sure you've all been there. Um, and in the end, I had to just be firm about it, and I actually had to get a lawyer involved, and I had to fight for my percentage of a song which I'd written in the first place. And it was my naivety, because I didn't have that agreement before I walked into the room. I was maybe 23 years old at the time, and just a bit wet behind the ears. And from that point onwards, I always, <coughs> We had a piece of paper, so I think yep. it's. I totally support that. Yep. Can just I just say one more thing? Sure. There's another one here, <laughs> <laughs> um, which kind of follows up what Gary was saying. It's called a song share agreement, hmm. and it's even simpler. It just sets out the name of the song, the name of the parties that co-wrote, if they co-wrote it, and the shares that you agree. And if that's not done the outset, as Gary kind of identifies, all sorts of contention can, can kick in. And it's about getting it in writing, agreeing it in the first place. Musicians are really bad at doing that because they don't want to rock the boat. They don't want to upset people. Yep. But I think we can all say uh, around you know, these tables that that's happened to us. And it's because we haven't had it in writing. And it really is important to do it. It's not difficult. Um, it, it's as simple as that. But it is so important to identify it right at the outset. Because once, or if it starts being successful and the money starts coming in, that's when the contention, the problems are, are, are going to happen. And as H Hassan also said here, um, you lose great friendships. Yep. Mm. I've fallen out with so many people that I was really good friends with. And, and, and what, one thing I would like to add now is there's, there's a little less revenue around in our industry now than there used to be maybe 20 years ago. And as a result of that, there is a big, I, I have a very good friend called Peter Oxendale who's a musicologist and he spends his whole life basically suing or, or preparing cases for lawyers to sue people. And there's a big trend now if somebody steals a part of somebody's song or they steal part of an idea, which is, I know this is a kind of slightly different thing that we're talking about. Um, they'll wait for it to be a hit, they'll wait and see what's going to happen with it and then at that point they'll sue. And that is, I, I find that a very, it's a little kind of business-like for me, mm. but it's a fact of life now. It's that a lot of people, uh, they do tend to think that way. It's like, please sort of sample my record, and, uh, yeah. but I'm going to wait until, it's, until something happens with it. Um, and whenever I sign a production agreement now, there's a little clause in there, as Paul probably has, has as uh, all of you guys have seen, where I have to disclose if I maybe, I don't know, take an example, say I sample something off a Depeche Mode record or something, and I use, or if, or if the band have used it, it's my responsibility as the producer to, to disclose that and be upfront and to get sample clearance. Now, I know we're not really talking about, we're talking about songwriting, <coughs> but it's a part of songwriting now. Of course, yeah. It's a big part of it. Sampling has yeah. become a big, big, big share of, yeah. of music writing these days, and this is where technology also helps. Hmm. And um, one day I realized that, hang on a minute, this is show business, music business, music industry. So we have to compartment and separate the two things, the word music and the word business. 
get this absolutely right, get the best musicians, create to your highest and strongest ability as an artist, but then you have to sort out the business side of it. If I was to ask the audience today how many musicians we have, everybody will put their hand. <clears throat> how many of you studied business? Thank you. One, two, two. three, three. <laughs> four. I just finished a course last week which is called Organize for Success. You know, how to compartment my business, how to do this so that, because I also, I mean, no advertising, make my own type of drum and et cetera, but that's a company now. It has the greatest drum, but it's, it's a business, you know? Mm -hmm. And the one thing, I mean, when Tony and I met today, the hug, if it lasted any longer, people will start talking. <laughs> you know? I enjoyed it. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, I would hate to lose one billionth of anything, of that affinity that we have for each other, because he thought, am I going to get paid? Or mm. I put that idea here, and am I going to be acknowledged for it? The worst, worst thing is the lack of acknowledgement, and that's what we worry about. The lack of acknowledgement mm. for what you put into the song. The money you will spend, my friend. <laughs> I think, I think um, yeah. which is why it's imperative now that we've come from a, a background of music and music business where we've had to cater for ourselves. We've had to learn it, and sometimes the hard way. Yeah. I think this is even more of a reason why it should be brought into the ed educational forum, uh, because there's so much at stake. If people are in line to earn well from it, they need to know how to safeguard and protect themselves. And uh, unfortunately, it seems like the government are not helping us in that cause because of educational cutbacks in, f uh, in uh, further education, higher education. But I think the music business will recognise that if people are going to come into the business, you know, youngsters of 16 and 17 are going to be creating music at home, somebody's going to create a massive hit in that particular way. Mm -hmm. And if they're not educated and they're not prepared, they are going to end up on the Sunday papers as, you know, an obit casualty or somebody's ripped them off. I know this for a fact. I know the young girl who won Pop Idol a few years ago. She's from Cornwall. Uh, by the time the, the industry finished with her, she was an absolute wreck and was her family and everybody else who supported her because the people who exploited her kept them ignorant. So I think mm -hmm. the business side of the music industry has to be part of the, uh, a big part of the educational curr curriculum. Mm. Mm. One thing I'd like to come on to here is we're talking about the digital future of music. It gets a lot more complicated or even more complicated when you've got this collaboration in the digital age, when you can collaborate via the internet. I've seen systems demonstrated where people in different countries are working live with each other. As long as you've got enough bandwidth on the internet for an MP3 and a webcam, you can see the person in their studio at the other end, you can cue them in, and then you can download the, uh, the high-res audio files later on. But you can get real-time interaction. But of course, this makes huge complications for all the things we've been talking about. I know Hassam, for instance, is very interested in this idea of collaborating on the internet. I'm also interested in other people's views on how it works, when it goes wrong, whether it's better to stay in your bedroom by yourself or whether it's uh, better to have a collection of bedroom musicians or in different parts of the world. What are all the options that you've got? Personally, I like to leave the bedroom for other <coughs> productions. <laughs> Um, I can give an example. We don't produce much there, by the way. Uh, I can give an example where, you know, this serves tremendously. I was co-writing a song with Shakira on her album, She Wolf. And she was in Abu Dhabi at the time over New Year's. And she was meant to come to Cairo to attend the recording session of the string orchestra. And then 
without going into the politics of it, Gaza and Israel starting throwing missiles at each other. And it was a little bit uncomfortable for her to travel at that time to Egypt, even though there was absolutely nothing anywhere near Cairo. Um, so we tried to set up the um, a kind of a satellite connection where she could see what's happening. And um, that would have really worked very well, but it would have taken time. The musicians were already booked and in the <coughs> studio. And then I had to make an executive decision of <coughs> everybody switched the telephones off, especially mine, and we're going to do the production, and that's that. Okay, but had we had that set up and in place already, uh, my artist at the time, Shakira, would have had the pleasure of being there in the studio. Now, many people who would like to collaborate with me particularly, um, like if they are in Los Angeles, adding so much money for the flight, adding so much money for my accommodation, so much money for my food, <laughs> and the transporting of my precious drums and type of percussion and whatever, it will add several thousand dollars to the musician's fee that I will get. But if they can do it and we can interact with, with a webcam, and then I could send them the stuff that will, because you see, I keep referring to Peter Gabriel because he really is my, my idol and my mentor in the approach I have for my music. And that is, you know, state of the art, but with a human face, <clears throat> you see? Like if you take 40 years ago, when somebody had a really great idea, they would have to write it down, they will have to get it scored out, and then bring an orchestra, get it tried out and recorded, and then they may think, oh, that part is crap, I don't like it, back to the drawing board. Now in the studio, you can do that very quickly. You have samples, you have this, you have that, and you can do it really easily. And you can then show it to the artists, you can show it to the record company, you can show it to the people. And that does not, and I would like to also please add, that that does not cut out the possibility that when you try to, or when you get in to record a preconceived idea, that you can't experiment in, okay, right, we can have this window made like that and maybe we can add this color to the kitchen and there are creative ideas. You just like put a musician next to another musician and then the energy starts flowing and then he likes this. It may not look exactly precisely what was designed, but it will be what was designed and accepted in a new fashion kind of thing. And of course, there is the, the the, the domain of coming, let's get, we, I, I have a band with some of my musicians, um, John Themis, uh, Chaz the Bat, and, and uh, Jimmy Sarikas, and a few other people, it's called I Am Spartacus. <coughs> and we don't have music. We don't have a repertoire. We just like go into a venue and we just play anything that comes out. This is as experimental as it can get. Sometimes it's absolute dross, and many, many times it's fantastic music that we record just on a little small MP3 thing, and we love it, you know, but now that we're moving into that domain of being able to kind of like, Tony is out busking it in Trinidad, you know, and, and I'm, where, exactly where? Dominica. Dominica, okay. And um, here I am in Cairo, and um, it's going to be so expensive to fly him over, you know? Let's do it together. Would it be wrong to say that that method suits certain types of music, certain types of production and creation, and other methods need that kind of coalescing of people being in a room together? Uh, because I don't... 
an example in a big country, which is one of my group's sort of biggest successes across the world. We played it with these guys, this Egyptian section, and a great song became a humongous song because of the interaction between the, 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 the eclecticness of the music and the song that was written in the first place. Mm. And I, I just believe it's the human touch that makes special things even more special. Where if you're sort of chucking files for ideas across the world through the internet, you're getting beautifulness because you know, everybody has the, you know, the, the method now of creating great sounding individual instrument files. But when it comes to making that whole concept a fantastic piece, maybe there's something lacking. Particularly the type of music I like, but then I can appreciate, I mean, Bjork, I love Bjork. And I can imagine her music being created in that particular way because yourself, people are in different parts of the world. And I can see it coming together in that particular way. So I, I think there's room for both. Hmm. But I think it's, it should be acknowledged and appreciated that it should come together like that. So I don't have any problems with either way, but uh, no. I prefer people in a room. Yeah. Yeah. I think sometimes the, um, the digital side, the technology can hold you back. I'm sure it's possible, or it will be possible, to have that interaction at, at some point. I know Gary's got uh, strong views on collaborating on doors. He, he gave me a comment here. The future of all doors will arguably be based about their ability to collaborate online. Mm. You, you definitely do feel is, that there's this two, is the There's two things going I'm, I mean, my opinion of the door is another story. I mean, I, I, in my opinion, the digital audio workstation is a post-production tool. I don't think many doors, and, and I know I'll probably open myself up here uh, in this panel for saying this, but in most of my experience, and I started as a, I, I started as a Fairlight programmer, and I used to, and I've been through every form of technology there is. I've used MPCs, I've started using Steinberg Pro 16, all technology, and that was a long time ago. And for me, it's always been a post-production tool. It's not, a, what, what tends to happen in a room, in my experience, is um, you record something and then somebody goes, okay, just give me 10 minutes whilst I sort that out. Now, for me, that is a complete no-no, because what happens is you pause for 30 seconds and you've lost that yeah. kind of, yeah. you've lost that flow. Mm. In fact, I don't like people having phones on in a room when I'm, I'm, I usually get them to switch them off, because it's been scientifically proven that if you are in a creative mode and your phone goes, it will take you probably 20 minutes to get back into that same flow, and mm. it will probably be different, as Hassan has <clears throat> spent has gone at pains to, to explain, gone to great pains to explain here. You miss that moment, and once that moment's gone, it's gone forever. Mm. Um, Isn't there an argument, though, that if you've missed that moment and it's gone forever, that a mother, another moment will come on? It's, it's like a meditation. You never quite know where you're going no. next. How do you know when one thing was the perfect moment and you've got to stick with it? Actually, Hossam's probably far more qualified to talk about that than I am. Um, it's just a feeling I have. If I'm working on something and if it moves, actually the criteria is very simple. Does it move me or not? If, uh, it doesn't mean to say that it's any good or not, but if it moves me in a certain way and I want to continue, that, continue with that flow and explore that flow, yeah. that's enough for me. Exactly. Um, sorry. It's that moment. Sometimes I listen to something that I've played <coughs> and it has that heart-melting sound, that particular combination of sounds, whether I played it or somebody else is playing it, and I don't leave it on the tape, virtual or reality tape, if it's not that exact feeling. And I know that every communication by an artist will have its own feeling but there is that heart-burning thing. And um, I, I just like, that's, that's my one and only thing. And if there is anything I have any disagreement on, that would be kind of like, this is gorgeous. But I'm not going for gorgeous. I'm going for supreme, you know. How do you cope then with the phenomenon that I'm sure we've all faced, where you've had a day being creative, and you think, yeah, I've nailed that. And you listen to it the next morning, and it's crap. 
Well, it depends on what substance you were on when you, <laughs> thought, say. <laughs> when you thought it was, yeah. Mm. You know, this is why I don't use any substances. Mm. I learned a lot from that when I was working with Pete Townsend because we would go into the various studios we recorded his solo albums. And we'd spend the whole day recording a track with Chris Thomas at the helm and um, the engineer, his name will come to me in a minute. Um, and we'll go through reels and reels and reels of tape doing different takes and then everything would stop after about six hours of, of taking that one track. And then the engineer would then splice together a take. And during that time, Chris Thomas would bring out the, the brandy and him and Pete would then start sort of knocking it back and then that's the end of the session. And then we come back to the studio the next day and listen to the, you know, this guy spent hours splicing all this tape together. And people go, that's fucking rubbish, let's do it again. <laughs> <laughs> this is where I think technology Brilliant. of today, <clears throat> yeah. the ability to but, have... But there's still, that's, but that's part of the creative process. Yeah. It's the fact yeah. that these guys make mega selling records through going through that process. Precisely. And obviously they're using the, the kit of the day, but I think the same could be said with people sitting down splicing files on a, on a, on a computer screen, but it's just not as interesting. There's a, there's a great story here with where the streets have no name, you know, from the Joshua Tree, where uh, you two were fighting over this. They'd got, because you two always record 30 minimum, sort of 20, 30 versions of the same song, because they can never make up their minds these days. And um, they were arguing about it. And so what happened was Eno got in the studio one morning before they got in there and he erased it. And he went, I've made the decision for you, I've erased it. And actually, they then recorded the version that they recorded. <laughs> and I think, actually, I think that was a big gamble. I don't think I would have done that, personally. Um, We're getting back to the fifth member of the band again. How much creativity and clout do you get as a producer? Yeah, I mean, it, it, it varies. Yeah, I, if, I was, if I was working in that situation, I'd be slightly more in awe of the artist I was. I mean, I certainly have, I, I've never erased anything, but I would certainly not be frightened to say if I think something's shit. Most certainly. Yeah. Um, but that's only my opinion, of course, and it's all subject. Creativity is totally subjective, isn't it? Yeah. What I may think is great, they may but not isn't think... isn't that one of the reasons why you're brought on board is for you to have an opinion? Yeah. 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 But the thing is, you see now this splicing of tapes. I love the idea that we don't have to cut any of the performances, touch the multi-track at all, but have the technology to be able to record the song 3,000 times, mm -hmm. and then comp together, put mm -hmm. together from this, that many versions, and we say, okay, now let's try it. Yeah. Like the same thing with scoring the song, and then trying it with the orchestra at a <coughs> huge amount of money. Mm. And if you have one of those strong orchestras, like the London Symphony Orchestra, it's gonna pl be played their way, whether you like it or not, mm. and it's gonna be that because they're a beast of their own right. But with the technology serving me, being able to make up my mind as an artist to say, well, you know what, that verse has got the same quality of performance as that chorus from that other take. So let's put this here and put there in this new line. And then let's get this introduction, let's get that drum solo, this, let's get that guitar solo. What, what does that sound like? Does that sound good? Good. No? <laughs> Goodbye. Let's try another version. I hate doing that. Yeah, I know, don't I you? I hate doing mm. that. I've just, I've just done an album with um, my old chum, Captain Sensible, <laughs> um, called A Postcard from Britain, Boys and Girls. I don't say it's available in a local record shop. There's nobody <laughs> left, is there? Um, but we started off doing that. We've been sort of talking about doing a collaboration again for, for, for Yonks, and we got around to it last year. And we started off um, by sending each other song ideas we had. And that kind of expanded into sending um, song files and we both had MacBooks and Logic and we did it that way. And then it came down to my gaff in Cardiff and we started playing the songs um, in my house in a friend's garage with a drummer. And it sounded just so much more, so much better. We dumped all the stuff that we'd, we'd done. Mm. And if you listen back historically, so many great singles, pop singles, are full of mistakes. Gene mm. Genie, T-Rex stuff, you know. Stuff you've done, stuff, stuff, because it's a feel. Yeah. It's a vibe mm -hmm. there. Fuck yeah. the mistake, it doesn't matter. Yeah. Who cares? Mm. So. If the feel's there. You know, all this sitting, and I'm, I'm a real old fart with this. I hate sitting and looking at a bloody computer, even though I've, I've, I've got one. 
some of the stuff on the album I've just done, I recorded on my Tascam port studio. And we, we actually kind of took some of the tracks off that and put it on. But it wasn't the same as actually sitting in a room with somebody and as you were saying, it's that human knocking ideas. Yeah. Because you, you get stuff that comes just in an instant that you don't get from something coming down a, a, a broadband cable or a telephone cable when you're sat and you're looking at this bloody little thing going and you forget to use your ears. Oh, look, that's not quite quantized in time. Who cares? Who cares? Yeah, I, I think one it's of the, a, one of the, the best hints the, the I... The human touch kind of is so, so important. Yeah. Yeah. I think one of the best tips I heard when mixing was put on your screensaver and don't look at the screen, yeah. just use your ears. Yes. Yeah, we spend too much time looking at music and not enough time listening mm. to it. Without, I mean, for me, I'm a bit of a Luddite in the sense that if you give me the choice, I would still rather mix someone's song on a mixing desk because <coughs> then I can only focus on what I'm doing. And, and I see, I always see a mixing desk like an instrument. Yeah. It's no different to a bass or a, you know, a guitar. It's, it's my instrument when I'm sitting there mixing and I'll, St I usually stand up when I'm mixing. I can't usually sit down, and I'm kind of running around. And I, whereas for me, the, one of the problems with mixing in in the box, and I don't want to sound like it because I do it all the time. I have to mix in the box. When I'm using a mouse, if I don't have a controller, I can only do one thing at a time. Now I know that sounds really mad, but when I'm mixing, I'm always doing more than one, mm. and I'm pushing faders, and I'm I'm not doing one thing. You're, you're involved, aren't you? You're, yeah, it's you're, a you're performance. Physically and mentally involved in, in the whole thing. Yeah. Rather than having sort of one one little thing to 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 move with with a mouse or something. It, it's when we used to re record, it was all hands on, on the desk, mm -hmm. and it mixes. The the best mixes were done on the fly. Yeah. yeah. Right. Okay. Let, let's. We're going to, write, you know, and somebody would like nudge somebody. Yeah, it's fantastic. Where did that come from? Mm. And it, it was just, it was real. It was real time, and it was a one-off thing that you yeah. can't repeat. I was saying about how do you know when a moment's gone? It's things that were, were created instantaneously from, from the way that we as musicians and producers were feeling at that particular nanosecond in time. That will never happen again. You can sit and look at a screen all you want and, and tweak about with it, but it's a very different process than actually being in a room with somebody and collaborating yeah. as a group partnership. Also, the, 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 any mix that you hear of any song on any album is only one tiny snapshot of mm. the development of that creative process in one moment of time. Because it could have been another mix that could have sounded totally different, mm. you know, mm. but what is happening actually in real reality today is that, and I watch that in the streets, mom gives iPad to three year old in his or her buggy, and the child is going trip 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 you know, reorganizing planet Earth philosophy for the future. Now, when this generation is going to reach a point where they're going to be making music, they have a new instrument we did not grow up with. Whatever it will be, whatever will be created, do you see? I think the new technology has created an isolationism yeah. within, mm -hmm. with the younger people creating music because anything anybody creates using modern technology sounds fantastic. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to beg of this, and people may not agree, but even shite sounds fantastic. Yeah. And people think because it sounds great that it is great, when actually the content is most probably severely lacking. Yeah. And I think the collaborative effort helps that, but that's difficult to teach. That's difficult to ingratiate into the, the new thinking about music making, using technology. Yes, slinging files across the world. So people do this, put that yeah. there, blah, blah, blah. But what you're... Again, not wanting to be a Luddite, great word. Um, you're missing something, and I think the quality of the, the, the content is severely lacking because it's not part of the thinking nowadays. It's all about making something sound great without actually worrying about the, the content, which is why you find a, a lot of... Lyric, lyric is sort of dying a death because not enough patience and time has been spent on lyrics. They're just fitting rhythmically and you know maybe just a bit of social comment here and there whatever but lyrics are not really sort of working on the same level as they used to be because of that non-collaborative uh, 
content of how modern te technology is introduced to the individual. I mean, I've got students when I suggest to them, well, why don't you look at the arrangement and shave it? And they look at me like they want to kill me. <laughs> because they think, you know, how dare you comment yeah. on you know, my arrangement that lasts seven minutes and it's all beautiful. Yeah. Whereas, as I say, cut it down to three and a half and it'd be fantastic. But they, <laughs> they don't understand the concept because modern technology is making them think in a different way. I th um, I, I, sorry. No, please go ahead. No, you sure? No, please, absolutely. What polite yes. Yes. Stream yes. of consciousness here. <laughs> I yeah. don't know. Um, really, totally agree with you, Tony. I, I think there's two guys you may or may not have heard of, Peter Gotcher and Evan Brooks, the two guys who came up with Pro Tools, okay? And Pro Tools is, whether we like it or not, I know some of us use Logic or whatever we use, Pro Tools is universally probably the, the, most, the mm. most widely used door. Mm. Um, and I think it was Peter Gotcher who, when he, he, he later realized kind of what he, you know, what he created, and he said the, the unfortunate thing with music technology is if you give everyone the means to make music, then everyone will. But that doesn't necessarily mean that everyone should. Um, yes. and, I th and I think there's an interesting, interesting thing. I, I totally agree with what Tony's saying here, because one of the things I notice if I have students for mixing, uh, for mixing seminars, there's, there's a real mental, I, I have a real ax to grind about this. People use um, channel presets. And they have reverbs on inserts, and I have a real thing about reverbs on inserts. I'm going, why do you have 32 reverbs in this mix? And then you're telling me it's hard to get any separation. And it, now, the whole idea of, of, of production for me, I learned that if the space wasn't right, I was recording something in, then I would move the bloody microphones or I would change the microphones. What happens now is people, they go, well, I'll get a plug-in and, and I'll EQ it but you'll never get it the same. What you need to do is to cap, it's all about capturing a moment. And for me, I think a little, a little of that has gone missing. And I think, I, just expanding on what Tony was saying earlier about education, I think it's, you need to pass on some of this knowledge. I feel like, yeah. um, as, as an, just coming purely from an engineer's point of view, when somebody is trying to get the sound of their guitar right, and they, they very quickly they want to resort to EQ, and I say, you know what? Just move the mic. Or maybe I'll say to them, maybe it's the wrong mic. Why don't you move the amp? Maybe put it out in the corridor. Do something. We've, we've lost the ability to capture spaces, which is why, in my opinion, a lot of records sound the same. Um, I, I know this is a bit of a radical idea, and people will hate me for saying this, but I think a lot of plugins have no soul. Um, I think if you create music with plugins, then it will sound like a plugin. Uh, this isn't my idea. It's Ed O'Brien's from Radiohead. Some of you guys may have heard him speaking about this down at, uh, there's a conference or a music publisher's conference down in Medem, and he, he, he talked a lot about this. It's, it's great to use these tools, but you need to be aware of their role. They give you lots of options, and it's very easy, as Tony said, to make something sound fantastic. It's, it's almost, it's kind of like a drug thing here, really, isn't it? Um, not that I'm sitting here saying, hey, I take those, because obviously I don't, but I think it's, it's like a getting addicted to chocolate, if you like. And that's a better example. Now, um, we're, talk now we're talking. <laughs> now we're talking. Now we're talking. Um, I think it's very easy to get lost in that technology and think that something's fantastic. And certainly, most times I've done that, I have come back the next day and gone, actually, that's crap. It's not very good. So I think the role of technology is, is an important one. I think we need to, we obviously, we need to embrace it. But... It does involve decision making, and we're not very good, some of us, at making decisions. And, and, and it, I quite often, somebody sends me something to mix, and I'll phone them and I'll say, there's 10 guitar solos here. Oh, you decide. And, I'm, I'm, and I say, but are you not passionate enough about your song to make that decision, to commit? Well, I thought I'd leave, and, or, or vocals that are not tuned, vocals that are not comped, and I'm going, you know what, have it back. You make that decision and then I'll mix it for you. Because I do not want six hours of being in my scientific mode before I have to get around to mixing it. Yeah. Sorry, I know that maybe is a little... No, that's true. No, I, I, I think that's perfectly true, actually, thinking about the decision-making process, talking about my writings for Sound on Sound. We get a host of phone calls from people who say, right, you're the people with the inside knowledge. Which is the best sound card. And you say, well, what do you want to do with it? No, 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 don't give me all that bullshit. Which is the best one? And you say, well, 
what do you want to do with it? Do you, uh, how many input channels do you want? Do you need to do this? Do you, there is no best. It's making a decision about what you need to do with it. Yeah, I, I, I agree with this. But going back just a couple of steps back to what Tony was saying here as well, education is one of the most important things. Um, <coughs> our son, who's 11 years old, is a phenomenal drummer since three years old. But I'm insisting that he goes to piano classes and he's really having such a great time learning about notes and piano and then separating the hands and all of this because he takes you know, stuff on the phone and says, look, I made this song. And of course, I don't want to crush his enthusiasm and I say, wow, fabulous. You know, and he goes on the iPad and he says, look, Dad, I made this piece of music today. And I don't want to crush his enthusiasm. I don't want to say, sweetie, you did not make that song. You just got a cooked burger, put it in a ready-made mm. bun, <laughs> and you put on a ready-grown piece of lettuce in the middle of it. You did not make oh, that burger. smell the relish. Yeah. No. Uh, yeah. Cheese? <laughs> I, I, t I totally agree. I'm, yeah, I, you have to teach them music. I, I, I started off, I, I bought the don't first Don't speak when ever, I interrupt you. That's right. <laughs> I, I bought the first ever port studio in a country in 1979. And I, I learned from that how to kind of, you know, put the tape over, do backward stuff and mm. put a pencil on it to give a kind of a phase thing and to mic stuff up. And, I mean, my, my take now, um, having come very late to um, recording on computers, is the fact that it makes everybody so lazy because everything's been pre-programmed by somebody over in Korea or China. And now instead of having to actually use your noddle and think, how, how can I get the sound in my head that I want? You just go through all the presets and oh, I'll use that one, that one, that one. And it's taken all, for me, it's taken all the fun away yeah. from recording, even personal, even sat in your bedroom. You can do so much stuff. We, Again, going back to this thing I've just done with Captain, we, we did most of it on a USB, a Samson USB mic, um, placed in a cardboard box with some chicken carts in the middle of it, and recorded bazooki on that, we oh. recorded 12 string. It sounds, it sounds fantastic, and we've had it mixed by a, a, a good engineer. And it, it's moving stuff about and not thinking, we'll use yeah. this plug-in from GarageBand, we'll use this plug-in from Logic. Mm. Everything's been done. And whilst that's great to use, and you can get an instant result, as I think Gary was saying, it makes everything start sounding the same. I think once you've mastered that, once you've got the hang of how to record, then I think the crucial thing is you've got to move on from that and almost go back. If we come back next year, I hope it's going to be called digital to analog instead of A to D. <laughs> we'll turn it around again because it should it, yeah. start with that and then go back to how we kind of... How maybe, maybe I'm just being an old fart. No, how, no, I, I don't think you're being an old fart. It's all, it I, all comes down to choices, doesn't it? Yeah, We've almost yeah. got too many choices today. Yeah, I, I totally agree, and I think that it is very important, and it's our responsibility as the grown-up, not really, um, generation to actually care for the future generation. <coughs> and I'm sure, Gary, you know, the boys that are kind of tea and coffee makers in your studios mm. are learning so much from you, mm. are actually becoming artists in engineering of their own. Um, a, a, a dear, dear friend, musician, composer, artist, you all know, A.R. Rahman. Um, in Chennai, he's built a school for teaching, and I thought, wow, he's going to be teaching them all that marvelous technology that he uses. No, 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 no. He teaches them to play tabla, Indian tabla. He teaches them to play sitar, surbahar, sarangi, all kind of other instruments, harmonium, violins, flutes. And I said, what about the technology? He said, you don't need to teach them technology. They already know it. You know, they already know the technology and they all have their own keyboards and sampling stuff, but they come to my school to study music and art. And then whatever they will come up with will be based on foundation rather than kind of like, I mean, 
my family get very frustrated with me. I listen to music and some people kind of go, and I'm thinking, I've heard this before. I know where every note came from which song, you know, and it's not mus music anymore because the create, the creativity part of it is already being done in another song that I know and therefore become monotonous because it's so repeated, monotonous. But we have to teach the people that are growing today and they're, they're just young people. We have to teach them about music, about art, about, about creativity. We must also get them on the right channels of the business, you know, and to make them understand, okay, boys, you're gonna be the cowboys, you're gonna be the Indians, you're the sheriff, you're the horse, you know, you are the this and you are the, you are kind of the person that is gonna be shot immediately and we all know what the play is gonna be. Now let's create beautifully. And somebody should know what uh, a G major or a C major chord is. You know, mm -hmm. what, what does this harmony mean? It's not just like use from that program, mm -hmm. you know, kind of write the harmony for me. It's not writing the harmony, it's regurgitating something else. That song is talking about this particular subject. So the music, I mean, I can talk about the music in Arabia in the olden time, because today they are all trying to sound like MTV. Um, the melody itself spoke the meaning of the word before it came out, you know. You can take the words away and you will feel the same thing from the melody and the arrangement. And that's an art of its own. <clears throat> Anybody can play an instrument, but to actually have that instrument sound in that emotional context of that lyric that we were talking about earlier on, that is very, very high level of creativity. And the arrangement, the, 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 the surround, the background sound should not be different from what this melody and this lyric is bringing. Today, it's like, I love you, I hate you, you're sexy, you're a dog, you left me, and it's all the same thing all the time, and it's just, there is no creativity there. They're all trying to sound like Jay-Z or like uh, Shakira or whatever. They don't understand that Jay-Z and Shakira came to Hossam to sound like they sound today. Mm. Do you see? <laughs> It's ironic that we're talking about the digital future of music and combining the best of ancient and modern. We seem to have highlighted a whole host of pitfalls um, with decision making at the top. We've got about 10 minutes or so left. I wonder whether I could ask each of you in a couple of minutes just if you've got any particular advice that you can think of to uh, the people here, just how best to avoid some of these pitfalls when dealing with digital technology, how to get the, the most out of it? I think really, for me, is, is just to be aware of their role and just expanding on what Hossam was saying there. There's a, there's a great book which you can read uh, called Cult of the Amateur. I don't know if you've heard of this book. It's called Cult of the Amateur, How the Internet Destroyed Creativity. Um, it's not written very well, but the point that it's making is, is a really good one in that we've, what we've really learned to do is cut and paste. Yeah. It's very easy to just cut and paste things. Yeah. And then most importantly, and Paul will have something to say about this probably in a minute, is call that an original work. And yeah. as Hossam is saying, it's very easy to just take little snippets and go, there you go, that's an original work. Um, that's quite subjective as well and controversial because some of you could easily argue, well, okay, with the birth of... Uh, of, of hip hop and thing. I mean, with the sampling of vinyl and that. But actually, if you listen to some of those early hip hop records, they were they were very creative. What's happening now, and I think the point that Hassan made here is that we're we're using it in a not very creative way. We're using it in a very preset kind of way, where we're not questioning its role. So I think 
Um, I probably have my two minutes almost there. I think probably my summing up here would be to encourage, um, I can't, I, I use technology all the time, but I'm always aware of its role, and I think that's probably the, the point that I would pass on, is, is to be aware of how that works within your creative sphere. And, and, and if it isn't creative, uh, then, then don't use it. Just, just be aware of um, what its role is in, mm. your, in your creativity, if that makes sense. Tony, how do you avoid the uh, perils of technology? I don't think we should avoid them. Mm. I think we should embrace them, mm. but I think they should be put in context. I'd like a redefining of the, the, uh, the producer and the recording artist to start off with. I think they're two separate roles. The producer's got an incredible role within the context of making somebody and their work sound fantastic and making it palatable, making it commercial or making it very pleasing on the ear, whether it's for record or for, for cinema sc scope type sounds. I think that's an important job that people who really know what they're doing in terms of creating great um, illusions with, um, with sound, I think that needs to be a context. Producers, or people who try to create music and call themselves producers, I think there's a sort of crossing of ideas in which it, it depends on just using technology for what it is. It's not using technology as a creative element, it's using it, which should be used as a tool yeah. rather than the creative element, full stop. And I think there needs to be more thought about into the creation of musical works as well. I think, you know, I think we need to go back to what's going on up in here, what's going on in the body, in the mind, in the world. I think, you know, art needs to look at what's going on and then put it into a context of a song or a piece of music. And as far as I'm concerned with my position as an educator now, is to bring that concept back into the classroom along with all the other issues that we were talking today, particularly the business of music. I mean, the one thing that we can't stop is the march of, you know, the musician being a businessman. I think we've got into that world where we need to make sure that that is a basic element of anybody's education going into the music business. So there's, I mean, the, the British music industry holds a very commanding position throughout the world, and I think we need to continue those traditions, but we need to update them and, and uh, just re-examine some areas, but make, make education, you know, for the new artists. I mean, I've got some students with me today. You know, some of them, I think, have got incredible talent, but Simon Cowell sees incredible talent in other people. We've all got opportunities to make people do something with their lives, but let's give them the right information. Let's let them look after themselves. Let them know um, that, you know, they play on a record. They can, if they're signed up, they can get their royalties from BPL or something like that. Just basic stuff. Nobody taught me that. I went through 30 years of of you know, enjoying myself before I started to learn this stuff. Let's make that normal. Let's make that a bedrock. Hassan, final words. I, from I you? couldn't agree more on on both points of view. And the most important thing is let's teach them the full spectrum. We, ha I mean, uh, um, there is a question that is always asked: Do you believe that? The, this generation <coughs> has better opportunities than the previous generation? Yes, but only if they are informed of the experience of the previous generation. Because now we have amazing, amazing tools on, at our fingertips that we dreamt of years and years ago that, wow, what if I could have just taken that bit and I don't ever want to lose that point of view like you're doing with Captain. You know, it's kind of like getting together and playing the thing live, you know? That is the most important part of it. Um, I may have kind of like deviated from that point of view when I had to do lots of productions myself, but now I'm bringing musicians back and I'm bringing artists to do more things live together. So, but you have to in, be informed and you have to realize that all the difficulties, technologically speaking, in recording studios existed before are now resolved beyond any imagination of any other previous 
analog recording studio. Mm. All those problems are already resolved, and now they're looking for other problems to resolve within the digital domain. But the important thing is, let's not miss the point of music. There is only 12 notes in the scale, but look at the amount of... Uh -huh, which scale? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> if I bring my Arabian scale, we're in deep trouble. <laughs> but there is, you know, there is so much music that can be made. Yes, use the technology to experiment and find how it can sound, but then bring the human element into it and let's make it right here. You know, let music, because there is, there is a thing that, uh, you know, I'm willing to challenge any computer to make. You know, is that choice of an artist in the moment when he's playing, he's, I'm gonna, nah, I'm gonna do this, you know? And the audience feels it. The audience just ripples with emotion. And no matter what, a designed computer is only as good as the person programming it. But you can use the technology to enhance things but be well aware of the art itself. Do you know, it's like when somebody kind of like goes to a computer now, let's go to a completely other domain. If they make a paintbrush that is Salvador Dali style, and you can just like go like this, and then come up with your own painting that is in the Salvadori style, you know, Salvador Dali style or Van Gogh's or whatever. Music, we can do this today with kind of like the style of rock, the style of whatever, jazz funk, and the style of what have you, but that's just an experiment. Get the real people now to play. But also, we have this piece of plasticine, clay, putty, whatever, that is the new generation, and it's our responsibility to say, look, here with this you can do that, and with this you can do that, and with this you can do this, and just be careful. My son, our son, had a band three years ago. And one of the kids came up and said, look, I'm the one who said, let's put this band together. And therefore, I should get 50% of everything the band makes. They were 10 years old, and he was seven years old. And I said to him, perfect, I agree with you. You will have 50% share of everything. Profits? and expenses. Hmm. And I said, what is expenses? I said, there will be time to record in the studio, so you have to pay half the costs. When the band needs to go and do a gig, you will pay for the roadies, and you will hire the van or buy the van and pay hmm. half of it. He said, Hossam, can I take just like the share like everybody else? <laughs> I said, isn't that a sweet boy, you know? <laughs> but we have to educate, and I'm not at all anti being a member of the musicians union because there are there are teams of people working of setting up these rules and why do the, how do they set up these rules and policies because we have all complained and said you know what he tried to rip me off and then they studied the situation and they brought out those wonderful templates which i think I'm going to be downloading very, very well. Good man. That brings us ne very neatly to uh, Paul. Yeah, you said it all words. far better than I, I, I ever could. Um, I knew. I, I just uh, <laughs> back up what you, you guys said and, and Tony as well. Um, I mean, I, I'm going to be talking about this in depth for about an hour in about half an hour's time upstairs about all the things that the union do with all these issues on band partnership, band names, songwriting, mm -hmm. income streams, um, quite in depth. And I've got some copyright and publishing handouts upstairs as well. Oh, so. Good. That, that's just to say, you know, but I think get it in right, understand what you're doing, understand where the income streams are. It's, all, it's pretty confusing, but, um, you know, obviously I'm going to say join the MU because we're there to kind of advise and, and represent and stop you getting into the problems that we've all been in ourselves over the years. Yep. Well, that runs up very neatly. Uh, thanks to all of you for all those insights. I've certainly learnt a lot during the last uh, hour and a quarter, and I hope the audience have too. So let's show our appreciation for uh, Gary, Tony, Hassam, and Paul. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right, lunch. Yes.